Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. Well, this is uh, week three of our We Shall Overcome Through Many Dangers, Toils, and Snares message series. And uh, during this series, we've been looking at God's grace during hardship. Any of you ever faced any hardship? <laughs> um, we've been looking at various tribulations in church history and uh, seeing that our problems uh, today are not unique to us. Um, Christians all throughout history have, have suffered different things. We've been mainly focusing primarily on uh, persecution and uh, being uh, persecuted for being a believer. But uh, just like the saints of the past, we are invited to focus on um, and keep our eyes on God's promises, his word, his faithfulness, and certainly the fact that we too shall overcome. So today we're going to read John 15, 12 through 16, 4, and that is several verses, but I want to read them all because there's something very special that Jesus is teaching here. He's talking about persecution. He's talking about hardships. He's talking about uh, going through rough times. But what he says to do is very unique. And it might be something that you wouldn't even think fits together. But yet these are the words of Jesus. So I'm going to read it slow because I want us to really think about what's being said. And I really want us to take it in. So this is what Jesus says in John 15, uh, 12, 16, 4. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in, in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This seems to be a, a reoccurring thing that he's talking about here. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That, it, that is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. Uh, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now uh, they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not uh, done among them the works uh, no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have uh, hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law, they hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, which he's talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you, must, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this, have I, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming that, uh, when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when this time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. Now, as we just read, the big idea of this message is this. Before Jesus leaves his disciples... Uh, he pulls them together and he tells them of all these troubles that are ahead. But he also tells them of peace and love and hope. So as we break this down and dig in a little bit deeper, I want you to keep in mind that whatever trouble may come our way, 
Jesus has promised that he'll always be with us. He, he doesn't promise that we won't have the troubles, that we won't go through the rough times, but he promises that he will always be with us and that we, if we can stand together against the evil with courage, we can do that because we know he has overcome. He has won the victory. So think about this. A pressing urgency comes when we prepare to leave our loved ones for a long time. My wife and I are getting ready to take a trip, and uh, we're going to leave our kids behind. And so you better believe we're going to have a heart-to-heart before we go, because they need to know this is what's going to happen and not happen, right? Right? Well, this is, this is uh, what happens. Uh, we gather them together and we tell them what's important. We tell them to, to be strong and do what's right, <laughs> especially if they're young. Um, <laughs> well, in, um, in this passage, that's, that's, the, that's what Jesus is doing. And we have the incredible uh, privilege of listening to what exactly he says to his closest friends. We get to kind of look in and see what happened. Before Jesus left this earth, he, he gathered up his people to tell them what to do. And he assured them that they too will face trouble and persecution in the world, just as he had already and was going to even more severely, you know. Um, and so he assured them and promised his love and his peace. And then he even gave us a bonus. He said, when, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the comforter. You know, he's going to send an advocate. And so Jesus summarizes all of this uh, with an interesting commandment. He said all of that, but what he kept repeating was, love one another as I have loved you. Now, most of the time when we think about how are we going to face troubles, we think, well, we're going to grab a hold, white-knuckled, and we're going to hang on. We don't think love one another as I have loved you, right? That seems like an odd commandment when talking about this, this topic. But his, this is his main idea. This is the thing that he, that he says more than once. It's the only thing that he says that he commands us to do. All the other stuff he's, he's exhorting and he's encouraging and he's instructing. But he commands us to love one another. So through all of this horrible stuff, that's what, he, that's what he's saying. He says, all of your troubles, all of the hard times, all of the danger, all of the toils, all of the snares, love one another as I have loved you. And he repeats it again in verse 17. He says, love each other. So though Jesus is about to face a brutal death and, 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 and though his final message is warning them of hatred and suffering, he tells his friends that they're going to face all this stuff as well. His tone is not one of anxiety or fear or revenge. This is something that, that uh, we have been plagued with over the last year. Fear and anxiety and, and revenge, <laughs> hatred. You know, so many lines drawn in the sand, so many uh, teams divided one against the other. And how much, how much better could we have faced these toils and these snares and these persecutions and these, all of this stuff that happened if we would have done the opposite of what a lot of us done and we would have done what Jesus commanded and we would have loved one another as he loved us. No wonder things spun out of control because everyone did the opposite of that. People dug in and drew sides and, and waved flags <laughs> and said, that's us and this is them and, and vice versa. And we're, 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 uh, we're, we're not doing what Jesus said would, would bring the victory. <laughs> he knows that he will send the Holy Spirit and he knows that we have each other. You know, these are the defenses against troubles. These are the defenses against going through rough times. It's to hold on to the fact that Jesus has already won the victory. It's, it's holding on to that hope, of course. But it's also the fact that Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And he gave us the, each other. He gave us the church. And he said to love each other like he loved us. Um, John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
ultimately, we have to hold on to that victory. We know that that's already been won, that Jesus has overcome this world. This is why later Paul will regularly exhort the young church as it grows in the same spirit. Uh, one example of this is when he writes to the church in Romans 12, uh, verse 20 and 21. He writes this, he says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, or by doing, you will heap uh, burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by, uh, with good. But that's not our natural inclination, right? If someone wrongs us, if someone hates us, if someone's on the other team and they do something mean to us, what do we do? Do we offer them something to drink? Do we offer them uh, bread? Do we, do we love them and, and do what the scripture says? Or, or do we... Uh, tweet something mean, <laughs> or, or say something mean back, or say, ooh, I'm going to get them. Da, 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 da. That's not what the Bible teaches us. No wonder this is, is, just, is literally catching on fire. <laughs> We're supposed to love them. Our enemy, it says, not just the people that we love. Those people should be the easiest to love. I know sometimes they're the hardest, but but this is talking about our enemies. Specifically, we have talked uh, over this series about the disciples and the early church and how they suffered. I mentioned that throughout all of history, uh, some of the founding uh, members of the Christian church have been persecuted and martyred, and they've gone through some horrible things. Um, today, I quickly want to mention someone who is from relatively recent history, and that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was a prolific uh, writer. Um, I have one of his devotion books that's just excerpts from a lot of his books, and, and he wrote all about discipleship, and he, and, he, and he wrote a lot about community and what it meant to be the church and how loving one another means to actually do something. It's not just a slogan that you put on a T-shirt. But loving one another is getting involved in one another's lives and, and being there for one another and praying for one another and helping one another when we're in trouble. But uh, he was a theologian and he was a German and uh, he was very vocal and he actively stood up against the Nazi party. And uh, he also spoke very uh, directly to the church at that time, because while all this is happening in Germany, there's Christians in Germany, but they were mostly being very quiet. And he was saying, hey, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be loving these people and making a difference and changing the world. Can you think of a time in the, in the world where things were, were less crazy and out of control than during World War II? and the persecution and, and all of the craziness that was happening in Germany. And this guy's saying, hey, church, this isn't the time to be quiet. This isn't the time to stand by. This is the time to, to get out there and love as a verb, not as a, an abstract idea that we think is, is cute. <laughs> and so anyways, because of him speaking out and trying to do this, he was arrested in 1943 and he was transferred to a concentration camp, and then he was killed in 1945, uh, shortly uh, before the end of the war. Well, in a book about Bonhoeffer, this is what it says. It says, When the Nazis revived and gave state sanction to new, horrifying forms of exclusion in an attempt to secure German identity, Bonhoeffer argued that the church in Germany could not simply stand by as if it didn't matter to them. Christians needed to see how they belonged to the Jews and other victims of an increasingly belligerent and bloodthirsty state. Indeed, how Christians responded to these vulnerable populations revealed the actual content and strength of their faith. He was basically saying, we can talk about all this good Jesus stuff, but if we never do anything with it, if it never means anything enough for us to act or to, to, to do something, what good is it? What good is it? So here's the question. How does a Christian community choose to follow Jesus' command to love? 
believing that he has overcome the world during a time of great darkness, trial, and suffering? How do we hold the promise of trouble and the promise of peace and comfort in tension in our daily life? How do we face the things that we have to face in life and still hold on to that promise that Jesus has overcome and that we can have that peace that the Bible tells us we can't understand? Uh, There's a film called A Hidden Life. And in the film, it tells a story of Franz Jägenstadter. And uh, he was a German as well uh, during uh, World War II. And he refused to fight for the Germans. And in this film, uh, it depicts, there's a scene where he's seeing his wife for the last time before he's going to be executed as, as a traitor, uh, as a, a deserter of not being willing to fight for the Germans. And uh, he's having this conversation with his wife saying goodbye, but it's showing what he's thinking in his mind as they're being ripped apart. And uh, in this, it, it, it shows uh, him thinking about a sunny, beautiful day at their house and the little girl that they have. And then he thinks of the atrocities that are going on and, and he doesn't want to be a part of that. And then he'll flash back to, you know, something else like his, his wife's face in the, in, in the moonlight or, or whatever it is. Uh, but then it'll flash to, you know, the horrible things that he doesn't want to be a part of. And it flashes back and forth and it shows that tension of him trying to make sense of, of, of doing the right thing and the cost that it's going to be for him to do that. Because doing the right thing, doing the Christ-like thing, loving rather than hating comes at a cost. It's easy to just sit by and, and uh, say nice things but not really ever do anything. But it comes at a cost. It isn't always so extreme. I mean, obviously, we're not being forced into the German army to become Nazis and kill people um, and having to, to wrestle with that tension. But we do go through things where we need to make some serious decisions and decide, am I going to love or am I going to hate? Because being neutral is not an option. We have to make a conscious choice to love because that's what we're commanded to do. It's not always that extreme and it's not always life and death, but there is always a cost. Because the smallest little thing that you do to show someone that you love them is going to cost you at least time. It's going to cost your consideration. In Jesus' parting words to his friends, he assures them that they will face trouble and persecution, even hatred, and we will also. We've all suffered. Everyone in here would raise their hand and say they've gone through hardships. Well, unfortunately, that's probably likely for all of our futures. We're going to go through stuff. This is part of living in a bent and broken world. But Jesus commands us to remain in his love, to seek the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and to be at peace knowing he has overcome. So this is a little bit more specific. How can our church actively love one another and stand together with Jesus against the evil and the trouble in our community? This is a little bit of homework. (laughs) This is how we're going to wrap this up. Um, If the band wants to move this way, this is is what I want to know. I want us to answer that question. I'm going to read it one more time. How can our church, how can you guys, how can me, how can we do this? How can our church actively love one another and stand together with Jesus against the evil and trouble in our community? So here's the homework. The homework is figure out how we can be better at loving each other as Jesus commanded. Pray about this. Think about this. Write some things down. And most importantly, start doing them. If there's something we need to work on together, let me know. But we're all called to do this. Also remember that before Jesus left his disciples, his friends, he told them that troubles were ahead. But also he told them of peace, love, and hope. We can't lose sight of that. We need to acknowledge that there's some crazy stuff going on in the world. But we also need to acknowledge that we have Jesus and he has overcome. As we face troubles, if you're facing troubles now, I don't know what everybody's going through. No matter what it is and no matter how bad it gets, whatever troubles may come our way, Jesus has promised to be with us always. Not most of the time, always. 
we can stand against evil with courage knowing that Jesus has overcome. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to come together with our family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just pray that we were encouraged and inspired to love each other as you have commanded us. And then it doesn't matter what we'll face. We've read about all these people that have faced stuff much worse than we face today. And they made it because they knew that you have overcome. Help us to remember that, Lord. And just uh, as we pray about this, as we let these uh, verses swirl around in our spirit, I just pray that you will just give us uh, wisdom on how we can do that better. How can we love each other better? In Jesus' name, amen.